one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance discussion. I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin, your moderator. And for the next several weeks, we'll be hosting Alliance discussions featuring some of the honorees of our 2024 Advocacy Awards. I am looking forward to this conversation today. Um, I wanna thank you for your partnership um, with Research America, particularly with the Research America Alliance. And today I'm very excited to introduce our special guest, Dr. Rita Caldwell, who's the recipient of a Research America's 2024 Builders of Science Award. As many of you know, Dr. Caldwell is a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland College Park and founder of Cosmos ID Inc. Her interests focus on global infectious diseases, water and health. She has authored and co-authored 20 books and more than 800 scientific publications. Dr. Caldwell served as the 11th director of the National Science Foundation. Now, before we get started, I'll quickly remind our audience to please type your questions into the Q&A box or chat, and we'll pose as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion of today's discussion. With that, um, I wanna thank you for joining us today, Dr. Caldwell. It's absolutely an honor to have you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Well, you know, look, let me just get started. Many people are calling this the new golden age for biomedical research. What is one new technology or breakthrough that you have been excited about lately? Well, I vacillated between answering that question between the CRISPR, <clears throat> which allows modification of the human genome, and the uh, wonderful vaccine that um, saved us from COVID, the mRNA vaccine, which I think is going to be very exciting. But I'm going to come down on the CRISPR because I think that really provides an opportunity to make very broad spread change. Just one example is the sickle cell modification, the, the gene modification, which brings health back to people. And I think that is terrific. So that's probably the most exciting, in, in my view, of um, the breakthroughs that have been occurring in uh, biotechnology and in medicine in general. You know, it's fascinating you used to say that. I actually got my start in medicine uh, doing sickle cell research. So I was excited to see that, that development. You know, your work on cholera has been cru you know, critical to reducing the spread of this deadly disease. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what work still needs to be done to stop future outbreaks of this waterborne disease? And how can we support low and middle income countries as they fight the spread of, of cholera? Well, that's a terrific question. I think it, it fundamentally, and this is about as fundamental as you can get, it's safe water and sanitation, proper sanitation. That, that's really critical and it's at the basis of public health. And you as the leader of public health can appreciate what this means, just having access to safe potable water. And for the developing countries, I think this is the biggest issue. And this is why I spent a lot of my time with uh, Safe Water Network. It's a, an organization that uh, right now is operating very effectively in Ghana and in some parts of India, where it's bringing safe water uh, kiosk uh, devices, but doing it in a way that empowers the community. So they own and run and operate uh, the safe water delivery system. So, so I, I think that's really the most critical um, task that we have globally as a humanitarian society. You know, one of the big uh, challenges we have is knowing when a new disease enters the community. Um, and you're doing some interesting work um, um, with satellite sensors. Can you tell us more about that work and how can we use to predict future outbreaks? Yes, I, I, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk what's actually occupied my time for the last 60 years. I started out uh, studying the uh, causative agent of cholera and um, to my surprise, discovered that it was a marine bacterium that's widely dis distributed throughout the world oceans. 
we learned that it's actually associated with plankton. In fact, I would consider the zooplankton, this little copepod, as the vector for cholera. Uh, it's a, an aquatic bacterium, so this vector doesn't fly like mosquitoes, but it swims. And what we have been able to do is determine the relationship of environmental parameters. Um, obviously, since plankton plays a role, chlorophyll measurements as a means of tracking zooplankton um, and uh, temperature, salinity, etc. Landsat, the satellite was launched in about um, 1985. And it occurred to me that this would be a terrific way to monitor the potential, the risk of cholera. So we did a little study um, where we downloaded the data from this Landsat satellite. And um, with a little computational work, we were able to show that indeed the numbers of cholera cases followed almost point for point the temperature of the ocean off the Bay of Bengal and the number of cholera cases in Bangladesh near, you know, in the Sundarbans, right near the, the water. And so that led uh, to our first publication some 24 years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where we suggested that satellites could be used to predict risk. Well, we've gone on to improve the computational model. And in addition, we've had access to some fantastic satellites. They measure everything from movement of populations, practically person to person population movement, coupled with um, much more sophisticated environmental parameters. And we now have a very powerful, somewhere between 80 or 90% accuracy of predicting the potential risk of cholera. And we tested this in 2017 when that horrible cholera epidemic broke out in Yemen. It was uh, really at that point the worst in, in history, or at least recorded history. And so we did a retrospective analysis, published the data. It was picked, the publication was picked up very quickly by a colleague uh, in England who worked for the British Aid Agency, and he literally telephoned us in January and said, hey, could you provide us um, four to eight week prediction for Yemen geographically where the risk would be the highest? And so we teamed up and we were able to do just that. We were able to show just where in Yemen the highest risk of cholera would be. And they were allowed, they were able then to, to provide um, medical care, safe water, medical supplies, exactly where needed. And we were able to reduce cholera in 2018, at least contribute to the reduction of cholera cases and deaths in Yemen. So now we have continued to do this kind of predictive um, sensing uh, for Yemen, Ethiopia, and a variety of other countries, uh, some 11 or 12 countries. In fact, we're really moving to a global application of being able to use satellite sensing with this computational model. And now we're introducing some artificial intelligence and being able to predict when and where outbreaks will occur. What's very, very exciting is that we picked up signals in Sudan well before the outbreak occurred, we were able to alert the UN agencies, and we're now even able to determine the reservoir uh, of water that serves as a source of um, drinking water for, in that case, Sudan, uh, and pinpoint um, the risk um, <clears throat> risk source. So I, I think uh, what we're seeing is the satellite sensing devices as a public health tool. We've been able to, to modify the, the uh, computation for COVID and um, for other waterborne diseases uh, besides cholera. So, so I think we have a, an interesting new technology for public health. Wow. 
You know, um, let me take you back a little bit. Um, you know, when you were a director of the National Science Foundation, you led an interagency team that helped track the 2001 anthrax letters. Um, I was actually the health secretary in Maryland during those anthrax attacks. So I remember that time with um, um, great interest. From that experience that you had, what can you share about the importance of developing a coordinated response between federal agencies to emerging health threats? Well, thank you for that question because uh, it was an incredible experience for me. It was um, a total of five years, but uh, right after the anthrax attack occurred, um, I was asked by uh, the CIA, the intelligence agency and the FBI because the FBI was doing the the search for the perpetrator of the anthrax, uh, where the spores were uh, delivered in letters uh, to uh, media personnel, to Congress, etc. It was a terrible time, very frightening. So we used the technique of DNA sequencing. And remember, this was 20 some years ago. This was 2011. And this was a time uh, 9-11, when uh, we were barely able to sequence one or two bacteria. Now, of course, we can sequence everything yeah. in our gut, on our skin, etc. But at that time, we had the sequences of a couple of small marine bacteria, half the sequence of Bacillus anthracis. And so I put together a team. Uh, every agency, NIH, NSF, DOE, Department of Defense, um, FDA, Department of Agriculture, Homeland Security. We had a representative from every agency to work together as a team to use the new DNA sequencing technology to track down the perpetrator. We met every week for an hour, Friday afternoon, in a skiff, which meant that no cell phones. Of course, in those days, the cell phones were like carrying a backpack. And now, of course, we put them in our back pocket. <laughs> um, but um, we, we met on a regular basis, and it was interesting. We had no official uh, capacity. We, we could have had a presidential directive. We could have had whatever we wanted for authorization. But if we were official, then we would have had to keep minutes. We would have been uh, open to um, the Freedom of Information Act. And the FBI was carrying out a criminal investigation, so they wouldn't attend. So we simply met as a group. We called ourselves the Genome Sciences Coordinating Committee. <laughs> and we met in a skiff in just across the hall from the National Science Foundation uh, main offices in Virginia. And we had to meet just for one hour because the FBI um, scientists came in from Virginia, and if they left an hour later, they would be caught in traffic, and they wouldn't get home till seven at night. So we had very, very accurate, concise meetings, and we met for um, every week for um, three years. And uh, we were able to fund collectively because the representatives each had access to funds to allocate for this task. And we were able to um, begin the sequencing of all the pathogens and, in fact, did track down the source. And what was very interesting is that I learned a couple of important things. And that is agencies need to collaborate and share data. And that's something that uh, in a study that I chaired subsequently for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, on science uh, um, during uh, disaster is that the federal agencies, really, some of them are not able to share data one with another. And so I do think that we need to have a change in that legislation so that uh, data can be shared and collaboration can be effective. So what did I learn? I learned that when you collaborate and bring some really smart scientists together, and work very effectively on a single goal and task, you can achieve amazing kinds of successes. So it was it was an exciting time. I've written it up uh, and uh, I was allowed to publish CIA approved and the FBI approved. 
um, in a book called The Lab of One's Own, where I describe this, um, um, how shall I say, odyssey of uh, three to five years. Wow, wow. Well, you know, Research America is all about improving the capacity of our nation to do more and better research. Um, you know, when you were the director um, in NSF and you saw the greatest increase um, in our funding growth in its history. Um, so can I pick your brain about how should scientists and advocates make the case for increasing investment in research? I think it's really critical that um, we have a unified voice. And what I think was most successful is that um, I didn't go to Congress asking for across the board increase because science is important. Everything needs to be funded. What I did was achieve a consensus amongst my staff. <clears throat> and obviously from the weight of the proposals that were coming in um, for requesting funding, where the, where the really priorities were. And we came down to three or four priorities. Um, one of which was computational science. And so we were able to um, argue forcefully and effectively and receive a billion dollars in new funding for computation, for computers. But it was done, I made sure that that initiative was a shared initiative, that the bulk of it, of course, would go to the computational directorate of NSF, but every directorate would have a piece of that action because it was important for improving education. It was necessary for the biological sciences, which is undergoing a major revolution, which is still in, and the social behavioral sciences. They're in the midst of, um, shall I say, the beginning of their revolution in being able to understand um, more effectively in sort of practice, social and behavioral activities of, of the human mind. So, so by the sharing of the, of the largesse and by the prioritization uh, and the agreement on the prioritization, we were able to achieve major breakthroughs. Another was biocomplexity, achieved mm -hmm. another almost a billion dollars there and it continues uh, to be funded. So there, there are some things, for example, I must confess that I have one priority and it may sound a bit odd, but that was mathematics. I believe, of course, mathematics is the Esperanto, if you will, of science, engineering, medicine, technology. And I surprised the mathematicians and we, we increased their budget from um, quite a lot of money, from I think $100 million. And as a result, we have seen an increase in the number of young mathematicians being educated and uh, entering uh, not only academia, but the economy. So I, I think it's um, a willingness to collaborate, cooperate, and to provide a message that's powerful um, to Congress, to the White House, obviously to the White House, and then to Congress, but more importantly, to our fellow citizens. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, still. Well, thank you. You know, those investments have served us well over the years. And in fact, uh, many of those investments helped us uh, respond to COVID. Um, so, you know, we're, I, I can't believe this, but, you know, it's been almost four years, um, you know, that we've been really in many ways dealing with thinking about COVID uh, since December 2019. Um, and, you know, you've had enormous experiences in bringing in as you said, um, under anthrax, bringing entities together to address it. Um, the response to COVID was a very complex response. Um, but in, in this putting you on your perch and your, your experience, um, are we really ready for the next um, pandemic um, or even big infectious disease outbreak? And if not, what do we need to do? Well, I'm going to sing your song right now. I'm going to say what I believe strongly is that we have not invested in public health. We have severely underinvested in the capacity of communities to, to allow, collaborate and cooperate. For example, in that um, uh, study for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on science uh, during uh, disasters, 
um, it became very clear that um, what we really need to do is to have a coordination. And in fact, really every governor should have a chief scientist. And that chief scientist should be able to coordinate the activities within the states. So that when a fellow, when a, a sister state uh, has a disaster, there can be a mobilization by a gathering of those scientists, chief scientists from all 50 states to collaborate, coordinate, and deal with the pandemic so that we would have a voice from science through the governor of each, each state. And, and so it's coordination, collaboration, and preparation. Um, we really need to have, and again, I'm, I'm singing your song, we really do need to have what I remember as a graduate student that I could turn to the state health department for answers. And when I was a young assistant professor at the University of Maryland, I turned to the Maryland State Health Department. It was powerful. It was incredible. Powerful academically and intellectually, not, not politically necessarily, but, but it had the science and the information that could tell me when I isolated something strange from the Tres Chesapeake Bay, I knew there was a, a uh, fount of wisdom, if you will, experience. Uh, and you could you could collaborate and work together. So I think we need to resuscitate what was a very powerful uh, health capacity in each state, and that each governor should have his or her science chief scientist, and there should be a coordinating council that operates on a regular basis. So I hope you will agree with me, sir. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about that, uh, because uh, you know my experience at the state health department was just that it's such absolutely amazing people who um had forgotten more than other people knew and but they but they knew where to get their information when they didn't know and they were engaged and they were committed so i absolutely agree with you and we need to we need to rebuild our, our, our national public health system in order to be able to do that well this has actually been an amazing conversation so far um, but, you know, we do have um, people out there in the audience. I'm sure they have some questions. So if I could maybe um, ask Jacqueline to come and join us and maybe we can um, get some of those questions from some of our audience members. Great. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. And thank you, Dr. Caldwell. It's been a fantastic discussion so far. Uh, Dr. Call, it's wonderful to hear about your fascinating research and work over the years. I uh, just want to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat or the Q&A box. So I'll start with first question. Dr. Caldwell, what recommendations do you have for scientists and physicians who want to engage more with the general public? I think it's really critical to speak often, frequently with um, the general public through the Rotary Club, through the Knights of Columbus, um, uh, Chambers of Commerce, um, the lunch meetings. I, I, as director of NSF, I made a point of, of going to the Rotary Club lunches to uh, talk about what was going on in science, engineering, and technology being funded by the National Science Foundation. And the other thing that I think is really important is to participate in the local schools. I have two children. Um, one is now a physician and the other is a, a botanist at the University of California, Davis. When they were going through elementary, middle and high school, um, I would get invited to come and talk to their class about my work and what I was doing and about science. And I always did that. I always would, uh, for each child, at least uh, every grade, I'd go and spend um, an hour or, or a morning. Um, sometimes it was terrifying because one time, grade one or two, I've forgotten, the teacher said, well, you're experienced, I'll go off for a break and I'll leave you to talk to the students. Well, if, if you've ever had to deal with about 25, um, five or six year old kids, it, 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 um, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> you have to pay attention. But in any case, it, it is important. I think if the children know that their friends, parents are doing interesting science and that it's relevant and it's fun, um, 
there are all kinds of things you can do, everything from um, bringing a little microscope to the class or even a magnifying glass and looking at mosquitoes or bugs or whatever and how complicated they are. These are the kinds of, of um, moments that really can spark interest, but also can engage people uh, if you're talking at the Rotary Club about the current research being done in astronomy, um, which is very exciting and surprising because it turns out that some of the lens um, improvements have improved um, eyeglasses for us every day. So there are applications even for the more what seems to be abstruse or um, research that uh, is more um, intellectual than applicable. It turns out that in fact, the applications can be very surprising. Wonderful, thank you. And I agree, it's great to have young the young people involved in STEM education and we're seeing a lot more of that lately. Um, so on to our next question. He mentioned a bit earlier um, that public health needs more investment um, so expanding on that a little bit, what are some of other larger issues you see facing the public health system today? And how can we as advocates best support addressing these issues? Well, I, I think the um, critical need is coordination and to have at the ready um, the ability to respond uh, to emergencies uh, for example, uh, destruction of, let's say, the water treatment plant. There should be planning ahead for, um, I guess it's called a tabletop discussion, uh, uh, where you, you pose an issue, a disaster of some sort, and then um, have a discussion about the response. And in that way, you can be prepared. So I think a strategic plan is really critical. Um, for the nation, um, and there should be discussions of the kinds of um, disasters that one can expect, especially during a time of climate change. It, it's uh, quite possible that a, a tornado can go through a community and completely wipe out the um, sewage treatment plant or wipe out the uh, safe water treatment plant or a hospital. And how will the community um, um, meet that disaster? And that's where my suggestion, or at least that report that we produced that suggested a chief scientist for the state, every governor, you then have someone you know you can call on who will know what the resources are for the nearby states or for states that can uh, provide some, some assistance and some, um, some aid. Well, thank you very much. You know, this has absolutely uh, been an amazing conversation, and I can't believe time went away so fast for us. You know, it looks like that's really all the time we have right now. Um, so I want to thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for, for joining us. And again, congratulations. Um, we look forward to honoring you in person at our award ceremony, which is going to be this March 13th. Um, and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, one quick announcement before we end today's webinar, please join us for our next Alliance discussion on January 30th at 1230 um, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Celine Gounder. Uh, she's a senior fellow and editor at large for public health at the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, Health News. She's a recipient of Research America's 2024 Meeting the Moment for Public Health Award. Dr. Gounder should share insights from her career and epidemiology and health news reporting on how we meet the moment and tackling large scale health threats from smallpox to COVID-19 and speeding the pace of medical progress. Um, the link to register is at the end of your chat. I wanna thank you for joining us today's Alliance discussion. We look forward to seeing you again soon and have a, a, a happy new year. And I look forward to seeing you at our next uh, uh, webinar. Thank you.